I'm torn because like this film is about the heartache, right, of being a Lions fan. But, but at the same time, but wouldn't wouldn't the flip side of that be the year you decide to make it, the heartache gets healed? And you get over the hump, and you talked about all the heartache for the whole year, and then you end the film with something triumphant. Isn't that the way movies work? I'm no movie guy, but I've seen a couple. This is my son, Michael. He's got my name, but thankfully his mother's nose. Two days before he was born, the Detroit Lions broke the 24-year-old Lambeau curse and beat the Packers in Green Bay for the first time since 1991. The following week, the Lions came from behind in a fourth quarter victory against the Oakland Raiders. A few days after that, in the best game I'd ever seen them play, they beat the Eagles on Thanksgiving. Exactly one week later, they were dominating the Packers at home, and I thought that his life as a Lions fan might be different than mine. But then the Hail Mary happened, and I began to wonder if it was right for me to raise my son as a Lions fan. Of all of the bad things, and of all the teams that could have happened against him, it's gotta be the Hail Mary. I had left a bar in Bloomfield Hills, I was driving home because um, I thought the game was over. We get to the last play of the game. Devin Taylor sacks Aaron Rodgers. Game is over. We're celebrating. Lo and behold, there's a flag on the field, the infamous face mask. There's a feeling like, oh crap. This doesn't feel right all of a sudden. We just celebrated. We won. We've already won the game, but yet they get a chance to run one more play. When Aaron Rodgers' ball is halfway to the end zone on the Hail Mary. You just kind of knew it was gonna be caught. Honestly, before he caught the ball, I pivoted and started walking up the aisle way before he actually put his hands on the ball. And I was on 14, uh, driving back, listening to uh, the radio call. And I remember just being numb and not surprised. And by the time he caught the ball, and those four Packer fans in front of me had started celebrating as well as everyone else that was wearing green and gold. I was probably halfway up the aisle way. I was, I was gone. It was, it was surreal to watch, yet we've seen enough moments in our Lions history that it probably really wasn't that surreal knowing how things have gone for us over the years. It may seem silly to some of you, especially to people outside of Detroit. Like, what is this guy talking about? I mean, of course you're going to raise your son as a fan of your hometown team, right? It's not even an option. And I know that there are other teams in the league that haven't been to a Super Bowl, let alone won one. I think last count there were like 13 teams. And I mean, hell, there's the Browns. But I'm not sure everyone knows what it's really like to be a Lions fan. You know, where I came up with this was, again, you know, like legitimately thinking as a delusional Lions fan that my son was born, they won two games, they're beating Green Bay with 0-0-0 on the clock, and that his life as a Lions fan might be different than mine. My very first game as a Lions fan was the only playoff win in my entire life. I've watched every Lions snap since 1968, I want to say. I've seen it all. To be a Lion fan is to is to be prepared to always be disappointed. Being so close and wow, and just come up short sometimes. I'm a Lions fan because it's like a marriage. Good days, bad days, and you pray for the best. How can you not love the Detroit Lions? Oh my God. I went through the 0-16 season and that was the worst thing that you could possibly imagine. I would tell you, one of my favorite m memories as a Lions fan, but I don't know. The NFL stands for not for Lions fans. It's like watching a show a thousand ways to die, but it's like a thousand ways to lose an NFL football game. If you're a Lions fan, you tough. You, you can make it out of the trenches. You can do whatever you need to do. First year I got season tickets, we went 0-16. And, and I'm still here, not going nowhere. <laughs> the victories have been a lot of fun. The losses, 
have been heart ripping, and I just want them to get to the postseason and have success. When I started out on the journey to make this film, I really didn't know what to expect. I knew I'd run into guys like Crack Man and Super Fan, people who had suffered throughout the years, but were still diehard Lions fans. I'd spend time at tailgates talking to fans whose history and knowledge of the team went so much deeper than my own. I had a surface kind of understanding of what it meant to be a Lions fan and some of the things that had gone on throughout the years. But as I continued to talk to fan after fan, I began to wonder, what the hell were we all still even doing here? But before we talk too much about the misery, I think it's important to remember that once upon a time, the Lions were actually good. Well, I'm George Blaha. I've been broadcasting the Pistons for uh, 41 years, counting this year, and uh, Michigan State football for almost that long. And I'm also a guy who was born in Detroit, was told by his father that he was going to be a Lion fan uh, when we moved back to Iowa, where my dad was from. And when I was eight or nine years old, I watched Bobby Lane, Les Bingham, and Cloyce Box. Box, uh, all these guys who were uh, great, great Detroit Lions and, and who were always fighting for a championship. I was raised in a little town of Utica, north of Detroit. We moved there in 56, started kindergarten in 57, which that was the last time the Lions won a championship. I was a little kid, I was like eight years old at the time. And think about that, I was eight years old when the Lions won their last championship. Jim Brown was a rookie running back for the Cleveland Browns that year. I can remember my dad's buddies talking about the championship days, the Bobby Lane days. Actually, Tolman wrote, he won that championship because Bobby Lane got hurt. You never thought at the time, because you, you just, as a kid, you expect that's how it's always gonna be. The Lions, when I was very, very young, uh, they were royalty in the league. And you were surprised when they didn't get to the championship game. Wait, did he say royalty? No, I'm not sure the exact number of people we interviewed for this film, but I'm pretty sure that George is the only one who uses the two words lions and royalty in the same sentence. You know, a guy like George may be able to tell his kids and grandkids about the good old days of being a Lions fan. But how's a guy like me, born in the 70s, gonna explain to a kid why I'm even a Lions fan? But maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Maybe we should start at the true beginning, how each of us became Lions fans in the first place. Uh, this is PGR before I get to this because there's the R version and the PG version, but for the sympathetic Lion fans, you are born to be a Lions fan. They, they find you, you don't find them. My father, was a big Lions fan, you know, grandfather. And uh, as the years went on, you just become part of that Lions family. Born in 1979, my mom and dad were Lions fans. Um, my first pair of clothing I put on was actually a newborn onesie with an old school Detroit Lion logo on it. It goes back to, you know, old school, just cheering for the Lions, just on Sunday, had the radio on. Poor family, just heard the radio for a while. And then we had the big screen furniture TV in the living room. So just watching the game on Sundays and uh, it's just been in my family, it's a bloodline. I don't believe red, I believe blue, so it's a big deal for me. Well, I got like pictures of me like at three months old in a lion's onesie. I have to give it to my dad. He <laughs> threw it on me, I was crawling around and I just watched the lion. <laughs> Since I was a little guy all the way up till now, they're a part of my life, I love them. I always sort of watch the lions in the periphery because I, you know, growing up anywhere in the country, you see them on Thanksgiving at least once a year. And as I started to explore the city and learn more about the city, and it just sort of, it got in my blood, right? This whole Detroit culture thing and being a Detroiter. They're the underdog, we're always rooting for the underdog. It's kind of what the city of Detroit's about. Honestly, for me, it was, you know, you're playing flag football as a kid on Saturday mornings and Sunday rolls around, you want to watch, you want to watch football. They may have sucked and they did. They were awful, but it was the only team you knew. Everyone around you is watching the same thing. So you all, you all got to complain about something really, really bad together. That's honestly what it was for me is we all grew up hoping eventually one day we might have a team that there's a little bit of optimism for. I was born that way. I first knew I was when I was about 12 years old, 1970. I milked cows, I lived on a farm, and my dad kept telling me, you gotta get out to the, gate, to the barn, you got some cleaning in the barn to do. I said, I gotta, I'm still watching the game, we're in the playoffs, we're playing the Dallas Cowboys. I'm only 12 years old. And I just remember we lost five to nothing that game. 
And I was so mad, and I punched the fence post going to the barn. So <laughs> at that moment, I knew I was a diehard fan for sure. How did you actually become a Detroit Lions football fan? My dad did that. He, he, he was a big football fan, and uh, I remember he used to throw me footballs when I was a kid. Growing up on Westphalia on the east side, we used to stand out on the, on the sidewalk and uh, fire that football back and forth. And I, I had a leather helmet, believe it or not. <laughs> I actually had a leather helmet to play catch with him because he threw it hard. He expected me to catch it. Well, I come from a family of sports enthusiasts, and uh, it encompassed everything. Uh, you know, Lions, Red Wings, Pistons, Tigers, of course, and everything in between. And uh, my father, grandfather, uh, you know, everybody uh, were big sports fans. So you kind of got it through osmosis. I mean, sports was always on. Uh, and of course, that was the Lions. My earliest memories, every Sunday, it was on television. It was, you know, if you wanted to hang with dad, that's what he was watching. I was born in Kalamazoo, and um, unfortunately, my father, uh, abandoned the family uh, when I was about three and uh, I had to go live with my grandparents and my grandfather was a huge sports fan huge and uh, was really into football in particular I mean he was an all-around sports fan but the Lions were huge to him you kind of wanted to you know hang out with your grandfather because you know he's the, the guy and he's into sports and started watching Lions games I'll never forget September 1st 1996, so I move here, and I'm here three weeks working at WDFN. And one of the roles I had was double shifting on Sundays doing sports updates and scoreboard with Art Regner and Steve Courtney. And the Lions are playing the Vikings. Week one, it's Scott Mitchell, Herman, Barry Sanders. Lions actually are playing pretty well. It's a low scoring game. Eric Lynch gets the ball on first and goal and fumbles. And I turn to Art, and these guys, and Art was a ranting, raving Lions fan who just got, and he just looked at me and he goes, welcome to Detroit. The first game I ever saw on television was the five nothing playoff loss. Has anybody ever lost five nothing in the playoffs? Only the Lions. Only the Lions. I was doing some research on that. There was a drop pass in Absolutely. the end zone, right? Like yes. they potentially could have, should have the won two that game. I remember the drop pass and finding out that Greg Landry, the quarterback, was vomiting in the locker room before the game. That's the two things burned in my brain. My father was a, not a big sports fan, but he loved the Lions. He used to scream at the TV with that same situation. He would say, Barry Sanders, the best player you got would bring you from the 20-yard line to the one-yard line, and then you bring in this guy? And he would, he would get so irate, he'd turn around and walk out. Even when we get like the tools to be successful, we still find a way to screw it up, yeah. right? Well, but it's, it's, we don't even find a way to screw up. I mean, you got to look at, you had Mike Utley, who, who, who could have been a Pro Bowl uh, offensive lineman. You had Eric Andosek, who could have been a Pro Bowl offensive lineman. One gets paralyzed on the field. Another gets run over by a car cutting, the, cutting his front lawn. Like, what are the odds of that? Things that just don't happen, happen to these people tragically. Reggie Brown, he, yeah. he gets hurt, and Barry Sanders gets 2,000 yards. That's it, that was the game. I remember being at the Silverdome for that. That was a, that's the loudest, one of the loudest buildings I've ever heard. Barry Five Sanders shows. going for 2,000 yards, but there was that 25 minutes of dead silence yeah. because Reggie Brown is lying motionless on the field, yeah. completely ruining the vibe of the day. How many things like this happen to other, other franchises, other organizations? It's like, it's only in Detroit. The very first game I ever saw was the Tom Dempsey 63-yard field goal. A fellow by the name of Tom Dempsey, then with the uh, New Orleans Saints, uh, November 8th, 1970, uh, Tulane Stadium, uh, Lions and Saints hooking up, and it looked like the Lions were on their way to victory. And I'm watching, and I'm excited, and I just loved watching Lions games with my dad. It's fourth down. There's like, I don't know, five or six seconds left. I looked over at my dad and I said, Dad, they're gonna kick a field goal. There's no way. Dad, there's no way this is gonna happen. And I remember my dad and I laughing about it. It's like, not to mention, and I don't want to sound like awkward here, but they got a handicapped kicker. The guy's got a half an arm and a half a foot. Some of the Lions players were mocking. And uh, I know for a fact I was mocking. They're like on the other side of the 50-yard line or something. It was impossible, 63 yards, especially with a guy who uh, who was born with only half a foot. I'll never forget. I'm sitting there. It snapped, and we're kind of like, like, geez, how short is this going to fall? And I still remember crystal clear watching that ball go through the air like it was had helium. It, it just it kept floating. It kept floating. It kept floating. It kept floating, and the ball like going over by about this far. And my dad said, 
the F word. He goes, can you effing believe it? And he goes, I'm sorry. I, I, I go, it didn't even register to me. I'm like, I wanted to say it. It's like, I can't believe that guy just kicked a 63 yard field goal. I didn't understand it. How did that just happen? Why did it happen? He's only got a half foot. And uh, I let out an expletive at the age of 10. First time I ever swore in front of my dad. Did he discipline me? No. He chuckled and said, get used to me. And then we went outside and we played football and it wasn't fun. We talked about that field goal for like the rest of the day. That was my first game. That was my introduction to Lions football. I probably should have known right then, this is gonna be a rocky ride. Yeah. A buddy of mine and I got a saying in golf, you know, because we're amateurs and, you know, we love the game, but we're never going to be tour players. And and our saying is, it's always something. Well, it's like that with the Lions, too. It's always something, whether it's an injury, whether it's a bad official's call, whether it's a bad coaching decision, it's always something. And, and you come to expect that as a Lions fan. The first game I attended was September 27th, 1970. It was at Tiger Stadium. And probably about three weeks in advance of that, my stepfather came up to me and said, hey, guess what? I said, what? He goes, I got tickets to go to the Lions game. They all played at Tiger Stadium, too. You don't remember that. I know you, most of you guys out there, too. You know, they played at Tiger Stadium, which is the adventure of watching a football game itself because survival is more than the game when you're there. Go to December, you go over to Michigan and Trumbull in an open field, an open stadium, in a square box, and you're watching the Lions game. You have to be a fan. And I still remember walking in and walking up the ramp and seeing nothing but green, green stadium, green grass, and there it is. You know, there's where the Lions are playing. You know, here I am, this little 10-year-old kid and having the time of my life. It was real football fans who went to see it. There was no glitz. They might have one cheerleader and she had one pom-pom and half a boot, you know, but that was the entertainment there. And I could never understand why people were huddled together with blankets on. And then you just see something being passed between the blanket. So that was like whiskey when I found out what it was. So that, you know, everybody was having a good time then. For the next two or three weeks, I was on a cloud and I couldn't wait. And then I still remember getting in the car. We drove to the, the stadium and, and, and I, I'd never been to a game before ever. I mean, baseball or this was my first experience at Tiger Stadium. Well, one year later, on September 27th, 1971, there was Monday Night Football and I loved Monday night football. However, I was a little kid and I always had to go to bed at halftime. I went to bed and shortly thereafter, my stepdad woke me up and said, hey Rick, you gotta get up. And I'm like, gotta get up, it's you know midnight or whatever it was. And, and my dad said, well, we, we want you to uh, stay on the sofa, sleep on the sofa next to the phone because mom and I have to go to the lake. Grandpa was taken to the hospital. And, uh, and, uh, I remember my mom and dad coming home and saying, Grandpa passed away. And I couldn't believe it. And it was really a sad day. And um, I'll never forget it. it. It was one year later, my greatest day. And a year later, my saddest day. So it was tough. And even to this day, I think about it from time to time, but um, that's life and time goes on and it was something that uh, was the, the highs and lows in just a two-year window. I, I don't see anything wrong with, with teaching your son to grow and have him be a Lions fan. You know, they, yeah, they haven't won a Super Bowl, but we have one playoff win in the last 26 years. Sometimes when you're on the low of lows, it's gonna be worth getting to the top of the top. And when they get there and they win the Super Bowl one day, there might not even be a town left. No, but that's the fear, Freddie, is that you quit, or you have your son quit, or you say, you know what, I'm gonna allow you to pick a team because it's just ridiculous. And then that's the year, right, Albert, that like, they go 11 and five or 12 and four, and they host a playoff game, and you want so badly, and as a dad, I get this, you want so badly to walk into that stadium with your son and hear that roar and go, oh my gosh, we're here for a home playoff game. 
Exactly. But that's why after 0 and 16, the building was still packed because you can't give up because the year you give up would be the year they win. And then you weren't there. You weren't part of it. You, you can't forget how bad the wings were in the 80s. The wings were horrible. Exactly. And I think some people almost translate that. Well, hey, the wings were horrible. And then they got really good. And, but there's so many organizations, right, that every like the law, like Lakers, right? They're, they're these dynasties that ebb and flow, right? But none of them have this history that this team does, right? From 57 on, there is the one glorious defining moment is a playoff game 26 years ago. I can't pinpoint the exact moment that I became a Lions fan. My dad wasn't a diehard and neither were my grandfathers. So this question about whether or not to raise my son as a Lions fan is a real one for me. But 91 is imprinted on me. I remember watching the first game of the season on a small 19 inch color TV on top of an old burnt out furniture style TV in my grandma Sally's den. That same year, a neighbor took me to my first game at the Silverdome against Miami. So I can say I got to see Barry Sanders play in person, but I honestly don't remember any of it. I know I watched the game against Dallas, our last playoff victory, but again, no real memories of the day. But what I do remember about 91 is not anything that I saw. What I remember most is the visceral gut punch feeling watching the Washington Redskins bring all of Lions fans' hopes and dreams to a crashing halt. So here they go. They go into the playoffs. And, and for the first time in my life, I'm thinking, you know what? This team could make it to a Super Bowl. And it started with the Dallas Cowboys game. I remember getting around in the morning, being so excited that we're going to a playoff game. And not only are we going to a playoff game, but the Lions have a chance of making a run at this thing. I had just bought a pair of alligator shoes. And the Silverdome Park was so full, they made us park across the road, and I had to walk into Silverdome. And by the time I had mud all on my shoes. That morning, it was so energized and so... So exciting. And I still remember walking into the stadium and I remember the kickoff. I mean, the kickoff and the crowd was like, I've never heard these kind of noises before. When Barry Sanders did that little run around uh, Casillas on Dallas where he couldn't find him and ran the touchdown. The Silver Dome was off the hook. You know, the chance of Barry. The stadium felt like it was moving at times. And on every play, when the crowd went crazy, now, the little Pop-Tart roof was going up and down. It was amazing. And everybody was just on cloud nine. It's like, well, this is going to be our year. I mean, this is unbelievable. The Lions not only won their first playoff game since 1957 at the time, but they crushed, demoralized, and destroyed the Dallas Cowboys. And then a week later, it came to abrupt end. <laughs> There's only been one home playoff game in my entire life. That was my first experience as a Lions fan. So that, to me, was, was the apex. I was expecting everything to be great after that, and it was not. We were a contender. With yeah. Barry in the backfield, we were a contender. And, and, and he left He left in the middle of the night, and, and, and it, it's what it was. Yeah. It's, a lot of fans will never give him, give him a, a break for that, and it was kind of late notice, but he was the best thing that ever happened to the Lions. He made us, he made us, uh, he made us something for 10 years. Uh, maybe that was the beginning of the Lions fans' frustration because it kind of looked like they had uh, a team that was, if not a championship caliber team, a team that was close to being a championship caliber team. Like the Lions were loaded in the 90s. They had some of the best rosters from 91 through 97 that you could find in NFL history. But what happened? They had the wrong coach, Wayne Fonts. No. Okay. Then they bring in a Super Bowl coach. Uh, Bobby Ross yeah, but, and but you know that, the punchline. Part of that though is the right, right side of your offensive line has things that have nothing to do with with the ownership or coaching happen, right? Utley going down and Andelset getting run over by a truck in his front yard has nothing to do with ownership. How can you not say that there's like no. not some semblance of a curse? I was because, talking more of winning and losing but, and then maybe if they're winning things like that don't happen. Was it 95? No, no it was, it was, it was Eight. 98. Really? Yes. Yeah. And the Lions lost on a Jason Hansen attempted 54-yard field goal at the vet. Okay. First of all, so with the wind blowing and outdoors, he wasn't going to make the kick. So they allow the media to go down on the field toward the end of the game, and you can get players coming off the field, and then you get the coach and the players in the locker room after. So Hansen kicks the 54-yarder to try to win it. It was a regular season game in Philly, and it came up short. 
I'm walking off the field with Hanson and a few others, uh, Jennifer Hammond and probably the writers, just trying to ask Hanson real fast, well, how'd you feel? I mean, people are throwing stuff at him in Philly. They're yelling and laughing. I'm like, you couldn't make that kick. And I'm thinking, it's 54 yards outdoors. Then you get into the, you're right, and then you get Ross after the game, and he just, he just went crazy saying, I want, you know, you think I coach that stuff? I don't coach that stuff. Y'all are hammering my tail, and you're just standing there saying, you're, you're right, I'm a good coach. And you're standing there holding the microphone going, oh my gosh, as he's spitting into the mics. He's been lionized. Bobby Ross is melting down from a Super Bowl coach in San Diego getting to the big game yeah. to this old man with veins popping out of his face as he's trying to defend himself. And you're going, this is not going to end well. Uh, as a 91 fan, a fan who became, uh, somebody who became a fan in 91, you know, I didn't know the exact history of this team. Good year to be a fan. <laughs> yeah, 91. well, until the end. <laughs> But, but there's all these little moments, right, that every other team has had a Hail Mary happen. Every team's had a, a kickoff, uh, an overtime run back against, you know, like, like take in and of themselves, they're not a big deal. But when you sit there and look at every freaking nonsensical thing that's happened to the Detroit Lions, but no is it was, right, man, for me to raise my son as a Lion? Like, no seriously, is it right for me to raise no my son as a Lions fan? The, the win in overtime. Aren't, aren't you supposed to do that, Mike? Aren't, aren't you supposed to? maybe have the experience maybe you didn't have as a kid, but you're thinking, don't you get bothered by when you go up and you see Steph Curry jerseys for the Pistons or uh, people in Detroit wearing Sidney Crosby jerseys for the Penguins? You, you wanna have that sense of, of community and pride that, hey, no, I'm not gonna be that parent that allows their kid to just grab a Tom Brady number 12 Patriot jersey and become a Patriots fan. But in another sense, because you've been going through so much and you've had such heartache going back to 91, you don't want to expose your kid to that, but maybe, maybe you do in a sense, because that's real life. Lions is, is real life to so many people around here. So the heartache that you've gone through, you say, I don't want to put them through that. But in reality, yeah, you do, because it, it's a learning experience that it's- Teach them how to lose. Right, yes. I mean, seriously. Failing, failing is okay. Sometimes, eventually but eventually we're gonna win. <laughs> they've been saying <laughs> they've been saying eventually we're gonna win since '57. That's 60 years of. I just want to see one before I die. The people who have been saying I want to see one before I die are dying now. It's the been problem so is long. Bobby Lane put a curse on us, and we have to beat that curse. For those of you that don't know, in 1958, the Lions traded their star quarterback Bobby Lane to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Legend has it that Lane put a curse on the team saying that they wouldn't win for another 50 years. Over that time, we went 1-10 in, in the playoffs, and in the final year of the curse, 2008, the Lions became the first team to go winless over an entire season. The unforgettable 0-16. Supposedly, the curse was over. Deep down, do I believe there's a such thing as a Lions curse? Probably not. But I believe there's a Lions curse at the same time. You know, I, I wanted to do some research, but it would have been poorly funded to see if the Silver Dome was built over an ancient burial ground. I don't know what was going on, but you know, we have seen and experienced this Lions team ripping our heart out and finding a thousand different ways to lose football games. Now, in my younger years, it would really bum me out. I would throw things I would say things I probably shouldn't have. Everything that should happen <laughs> just doesn't happen. Well, who else has one of their finest offensive linemen laying on a chase lounge chair on his front lawn gets hit by a semi truck? Okay, nobody else does. Ooh. That doesn't happen to Eric oh. Andelsek. The the God pizza. rest his soul. Yeah. God rest your soul, Eric. Taking the wind. Has there ever been another team to ever take the wind? Take okay, the I mean, there. What does that mean? Marty Morningwig took the wind. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Nobody does that. So there's always been this black cloud, for lack of a, a better way to put it, that's been over the organization where these strange things happen. Could those two guards, could they have helped us pave the way to a Super Bowl at some point? I don't know. But to lose your two starting guards, one to paralysis and the other one's you know, passed away, that's different. That's different than an ACL, you know? It's different from so shoulder surgery. That's different from losing somebody to free agency. Uh, it's just, it's different being a Lions fan. 
how could we forget William Clay Ford when he purchased the team? The darkest day in America, one of the darkest days in American history. He purchased the team when John F. Kennedy was shot and assassinated. That's right, same day. Really? Same day. I didn't know that. November 22nd, 1963. Not purposely, but to stay morbid, the Lions are the only organization to have a player die on the field. And then I'll never forget uh, the fateful Sunday when uh, when I left work and went over to watch the Lions and the Bears. And uh, near the end of the game, we saw Chuck Hughes, number 85, the wide receiver, collapse on the field. We're in the upper deck, and, and we're watching, and we're seeing Dick Butkus over, over, looking over Hughes. Dick Butkus, who Lions fans considered one of the dirtiest players in the history of the game. And all we kept thinking about was, did Butkus hit him? Did, because nobody knew what happened to him. We just saw him laying on the ground. You know, he was running his pattern, literally had a heart attack on the field and, and died right there. And to hear, to hear that call on the radio, obviously they didn't know he was, was dead initially, but to hear he's down and he's not moving and they have to bring the stretcher out for him, that was that was surreal as a child too to hear that on the radio and then you find out later he passed away on the field. How many times has that happened in NFL history where a player died, literally died during a play? I was at the game and you believe it or not left and I'm glad I did leave when Chuck Hughes died on the field. I was at that, it was 71, I think I was at that game. But I had left before the game was born, I was getting out of there, so I had left. And I heard about it later, but when you know, your parents are little, you don't want to tell you what happened. Oh, I said, what, what are they talking about? Oh, never mind, you don't need to know. And then it wasn't until afterwards we, uh, I, would, I remember I got on a bus and uh, heard Bob Reynolds on the radio talking about it. And he announced that Chuck Hughes had died and uh, that it was a heart attack. And, and we were just absolutely crushed. You know, and it was one of those things where, you know, a life lesson, things happen in life, son. He's, he's at his job and he passed away no different than you know, someone else who who dies at their job or at their home. So, you know, when you find out that it wasn't necessarily football related, but it was still surreal. He was, he was wearing Honolulu blue and silver on the field at Tiger Stadium, and, and he, that's where he died. You know, the, those are the kinds of things that have happened to the Lions. But I mean, it's a team who's, who once hired a head coach who was a, a Super Bowl coach in Baltimore, Don McCafferty, who died in training camp walk into his car. And so it's a team that's been beset by bad luck. It's been cursed, sure. But, uh, but it's a team that uh, overall just has not been good enough for a long period of time. But for the Lions fan, that just means one thing. Next year's the year. Full disclosure. So, you know, I chose to be a Lions fan in 91, right? Well, maybe I chose. I started watching it and they sucked me in, whatever. When I moved to Florida in 2004, I tried to actually quit the team. I it's going to be a Tampa fan, right? But ended up going to uh, bars to watch the game because it wasn't on back then, right? Whatever, 2004 that was. So I go into this hole-in-the-wall bar, and I find a, a seat at the end of the bar, and it's, it's beautiful, right? Like the Lions are on TV right there. And I'm like, well, you know, there's nobody. This is perfect. I'm going to sit down. So I sit there, and I start to watch the game, and I feel this tap on my shoulder, and turn around, it's this guy wearing a, a Lions shirt. I'm like, oh, hey, hey, buddy, what's up? He's like, hey. That's my, that's my lucky seat. I've been sitting there 20 years. And, I, and I'm just like, in my head, I'm just like, if I take this guy out back and kill him right now, the curse will be over and we will win, right? Lucky. It's his fault, yeah. Lucky, in my head, I'm like, lucky seat. <laughs> lucky for who? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he might have but, a good time and maybe he's gambling. Some, but, some decent food. And... What, I mean, that mentality that as a Lions fan in 2004, you have a lucky seat. Was what would it lucky ever in made you think that or the 20 years before that, right? Oh my gosh. People that say they're Lions free, I, some of it, I, maybe Art Regner, I get it, because he, sh he did post game shows for so many years, they tormented him, but everybody that says, oh, nope, not this year, I'm Lions free. Then when I see him that first week, I'm like, what are you doing Sunday, huh? Don't give me this stuff about going to the cider mill. But you might You're not, watching the team. You might not watch the whole game. But, but you're you know gonna going you're on. gonna follow it exactly. You know you're gonna because look, absolutely. I'm not always in town to watch games or whatever, but I'll always be on my phone. Okay, what are the lines doing? What's the score? I'm trying to catch it on a TV somewhere. You might not you might not be engaged for the whole four quarters. But if you're from Detroit and you like football, you're you're you're, you're watching what the Lions do. I wrote a resignation letter, resi resigning as a fan. I'm done with this organization. Right? How many times? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The very the, this, the, the, the the next Sunday, I'm there watching it because. I, it is for me 
an addiction. But then how would your son not be able to see Dan Orlovsky running out of the back of the end zone? Those memories. Uh, Kelvin Johnson not making the catch in Chicago. Opening, no, opening. No, he made the catch. They just ruled it yeah. wasn't a catch. Right, there's, there's, so there's that thought that if Calvin was on the Packers. Jim Schwartz going for a fake field goal in Pittsburgh. Well, when they that, when, uh, well wait. Here's two, two more things when I was talking about only the Lions. The fact that Calvin Johnson, that catch, caused a rule change. The, um, oh, there was another one. It just slipped my head. There was another, another uh, uh, event that happened to the Lions. Rule change. It's like, yeah. It seems like anytime something happens to the Lions and it's controversial, there's a rule change because the way the rule was or the way it was ruled and forced, the Lions find a way to exploit it. And, and the NFL goes and changes what's happened. When Raider fans get really upset about the tuck rule, yep. they say we always get screwed. Uh, you know, the, the Patriots ended up winning that game and everything. And it's like, no, man, ask the people in Detroit. The Raiders had it lifted John Madden up in the air back mm -hmm. in the 70s, or it was late 60s, early 70s, when they won the Super Bowl. Yep. Don't, don't give me that. Don't, no, don't, don't go to Detroit with that mess and talk about the tuck rule when there's been one playoff win in 60 years. And then the out of bounds in Seattle not too long ago, a few years yeah, back. Oh, the illegal the batting, yes, illegal, illegal batting. I mean, we, the, the Pettigrew, right, pass interference, picked up flags. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the single worst officiated games of all time. Yeah. Back on that playoff game, uh, I don't know the date, I, I don't know when it was, because I, 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 a piece of me has been gone since because of what the NFL did to Lions fans as a whole. Uh, that day, it was like Toto grabbed the curtain and pulled it back just a little bit and saw Roger Goodell making a phone call while they were marching off a penalty for all Lions fans while obviously pass interference was had happened. But yet, they wanted to pick up the flag and walk it back because clearly the NFL wanted Ice Bowl 2 and, and wanted to screw the Lions once again because I don't know if in the, in the history of the NFL has a penalty ever been flagged, walked off, ball marked, and then picked back up and, and made it as if it never happened, like we didn't see what happened. Is that part of the curse? Because we were going to win that playoff game. We, I mean, we were, we were about to salt it away. We have all these little strange things that happen to us. The, the phantom face mask, on Devin Taylor, the play before the Hail Mary. Did his hand touch the face mask? Absolutely. Did he grab it and yank it? Absolutely not. And we find out later after the game, you can touch the face mask, but you can't grab it. So touching it was not a penalty. We find that out afterwards. Is that part of the curse? Is that part of Lion's luck? I, I've never believed in the curse. I've always felt that the biggest issue with the Lions and why you've seen a lot of the problems that they had is, is started with ownership, meaning he kept a lot of the same guys for a long time, whether it be uh, Russ Thomas, uh, Chuck Schmidt, Matt Millen, and then when he would fire Matt Millen, he would hire Martin Mayhew. If he fired Russ Thomas, he kept the guy that was underneath him. And if he fired a coach, he would keep, if he fired Daryl Rogers, he hired Wayne Fonts. I think a lot of the problems with the Lions is not the curse, it's because the ownership. But, but what, does ownership, what does ownership have to do with the, the coin toss where Jerome Bettis says, head tails? Right? That, <laughs> another infamous Lions moment, right? That, but there, but, but Mike, the there are people that feel that until that family sells, and it's the biggest old bit in Detroit sports history, that they feel like the curse may be lifted and that that coin toss wouldn't have happened. or. If they were to sell and someone else were to buy it, these things would be reversed. And that's, again, that's an opinion of somebody that either believes in that stuff or doesn't. But I mean, you can look at that with everything. Like Marty Morningweg, great offensive coordinator, couldn't be a head coach. Then you have uh, a Mariucci who, who was winning in San Francisco. Now, granted, you know, but see, people that's, argue that's that, the but best still, example. Just, you brought in Steve Mariucci, and I remember yeah. that presser at Ford Field. Yeah. I mean, he look, he's in that, blue that suit. Honolulu that, blue suit. But he's in a sweet looking suit and he looks the part and you're yeah. saying to yourself, oh my gosh, the Fords have they actually hired Steve Mariucci, right. like a, a you know, genius in after San Francisco. They after Michigan they told Martin he was safe, 
Two yeah. weeks later, boom, they came. But that's okay. But see, that was a good thing. They, it's business. Right. That they told Morty Morty one Matt thing. Matt Millen, when they heard, brought Matt Millen, remember, they were going to keep um, um, Moeller. Yep. And then, then a couple weeks later, they fired him. But that's the thing, too. Even Matt Millen, when Matt Millen came in, I remember they did a Center Point Marriott up in Pontiac. I remember that press conference being there. And everybody wanted Matt Millen there. And he came in and he just said everything right. And then we had 10 years of futility. It's like, you, you, it, it's the same thing with him. You, you just, you look at that, that person up there and you're like, wow, it's finally going to change. And it's the same thing that's, year after year after Lyons year. That's Lions luck there. He got rid of Gary Moeller. Worst mistake he made was the break for his first move. Getting rid of Gary yeah, Moeller. But, but what's ironic is Moeller was in house. And so after the Edinger kick, everybody was like, mm -hmm. maybe Moeller shouldn't stay. Christmas but a lot of people Eve. liked Gary Moeller. So when they've kept the guys in house like Mayhew staying and becoming GM, it fails. But when they let Moeller walk, that it failed, failed too. too. So to say, well, the Fords always keep people. No, you're right. Moeller yeah. got pushed out. Morning, we had another year left in his contract, got pushed out. Either, it doesn't matter, you know, well, you're flipping the coin and it's the, always the tails. The kick it's, is it's, it's, it's it's funny it's, because... Mr. Ron, four games. <laughs> when you saw that kick, did you really think that that would, that would cause, like, the 10 years of futility that you had under Matt Miller? Right, because if Edinger <laughs> misses that kick, Moeller State keeps Correct. his job. And that kick went from the left. Right, and it's a totally different that thing. That kick went from the left to the right, and, 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 hit, and story will tell you is... Apparently, people were leaving that game, and when they opened the Silver Dome doors, that wind pushed that ball to the right. If you ask anybody that was at that game, they that's, would tell that, That's not true. That, that's, that's, but, that they talk about. That's they talk, just, Kevin, am I right on that? They, they talk about people more. leaving when they, they open the. If you ever been to the Silver Dome, you open those doors. Bobby boom, Lane right. that, they, that came. Yeah, yeah they, it's the revolving doors that they push right. open those doors, and boom, that ball went all the way to the right, wow. and boom, right down the middle. You really think, though, that's going to cause the kick to go through? I'm telling you, that's what they were talking That was the doors. talk back then. It was. <laughs> I think that's what I didn't open the door. I was in the casino watching that game. I remember <laughs> but saying, I what think, is going on? I think that's what we do as Lions fans to kind of make sense of, like, just why we can still even be Lions fans, right? There's something there that, and I think it feeds into the Detroit, you know, everybody's got the everybody versus everybody t-shirts, right? But I truly yeah. think that Detroit has the right to, to claim a Detroit versus everybody mentality. And I'm wondering if some of that, like, the wind, the ghost, the curse, the refs, whatever, you know, feeds into that and helps to make us a stronger community of fans. Absolutely, which takes you all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, which is why you need to raise your son as a Lions fan, because us as Detroiters and people from this region, we've been through the automotive industry and, you know, all the way back to, what was it, the 50-year uh, anniversary of the riots, and we've been through all that and we don't quit, we don't bail. So not bailing should reward the fan base eventually. It really should. I mean, it's incredible. Albert said it earlier. I mean, the, the packed houses at Ford Field for some bad teams. Yep. Bad teams. Old 16. You know, it, it's... I mean, but even going back to the Silver, Silver you were selling 80,000 sure. tickets. And it wasn't like, I mean, yeah, they didn't do it every week, but they did it the majority of the season. They were yeah. putting 80,000 people in the stadium to watch that team. And then when they didn't sell out, I was that fan that would drive to Battle Creek so I can watch the game because you have to the be a black guy, TV the old, blackout. Exactly. The, the loyalty that the Fords showed to some of their person in-house personnel, I think is, is also a loyalty that they actually have probably shown to the fans by fighting for the most sacred thing that we as Lions fans have, and that's the Thanksgiving Day game. Thanksgiving is the Detroit Lions. Uh, that's uh, it's always been that way in our household and uh, it, everything the meal the dessert the company everything's always been in our house around the game uh, and and you give thanks that we got a pro football team in town I think we need to cherish those traditions like Thanksgiving and that's why I'm so glad that they the Lions have fought for it over the years Thanksgiving Day the NFL remember wanted to take it away you know, the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs, yeah, how come the Lions always get Thanksgiving? Because it's tradition. Because football and Thanksgiving go together here in Detroit like nobody's business. We go back to Kalamazoo every Thanksgiving, so from the time our son was you know, born, I mean, he was born in December, well, the following year, I mean, he's not even one years old yet, we got him in the car going back to Kalamazoo, and we'd watch the Lions game. He doesn't even know it, but he's in a bassinet there watching a Lions game, you know, with the rest of us. And as he got older, that was a tradition. You know, my, my son, my, my dad, myself, my brothers, 
uh, my, and even a couple friends sitting in front of that TV set during a Lions Thanksgiving Day game. I'll never forget them. They were the, the, some of the greatest times of my life. My most memorable Detroit Lion game was in the fall of 62. Uh, they smashed the Packers on Thanksgiving Day. I, I watched it on TV. Uh, they sacked Bart Starr 10 times. 10 times. We're right here in this spot every Thanksgiving. We have our family Thanksgiving the day after. So Friday is our Thanksgiving at home. Thanksgiving Day is right here in the D. Talk about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was the house shut down, man. It was just the Lions. My grandparents, our grandfather would come by and we would just talk about the Lions. It was a real big deal in our house. You know, I like I said, I try to be positive, but usually <laughs> it's us sitting around the table, obviously eating turkey and a lot of swearing, a lot of same old Lions. Unfortunately, I don't say that because I'm a little bit more positive, but you know, usually they don't do too well. <laughs> For us, it's you get, you get the entire family together and dinner's being cooked. While dinner's cooking, the guys are upstairs, usually one or two of the women are up there as well, and we're watching the lines, and like he said, swearing, cursing, yelling at the broadcasters, everything that doesn't make any sense. But we know it's Thanksgiving, and we all have a little bit of hope because for some reason, it's the one time of the year you know the Lions have a chance. You know they go out, they step on that field on Thanksgiving, you know they're gonna pull themselves together and do it for the family. As a kid, some of my fondest memories, uh, you know, watching the Lions with my dad, my brother, my sister, my mom, watching the Lions game, and then, you know, going to my uh, aunt and uncle's house for Thanksgiving dinner with the family. I mean, and, and if the Lions lost earlier in that day, I didn't really want to watch because I was completely bummed out. Uh, but it's so important, uh, you know, that families are involved because as families, we all have eternal hope that this is going to be the year the Lions take it to the next level and give us something to cheer about. Remember Thanksgiving Day began with a parade in downtown Detroit. And then when you got to Warren, you had to go to the Silverdome. Now it's all downtown, which it makes it even better. But then it was like, okay, the parade's over. We got like an hour to get to the game. You go to the Silverdome and everybody's in a good cheer. Either they ate already early or they're ready to eat and they want to get this thing over with. It's the, it was the only national game the Lions ever played because they, at that time they weren't getting on, you know, Monday night football. And that was the only two games you played. So everybody had to wear stuff so they would be seen by the camera. You know, you, I always wanted these people to dress up in games too. I mean, what do you do with that stuff after the game's over? You know, like the Oakland Raider Lion type people. What, do you take that home? You, you got that in the closet and, uh, okay, a little too much. Just back that off a little bit. But everybody will wear that stuff on Thanksgiving. It's always some guy in a blue and silver uh, Santa suit. Where you bought it, I have no idea. Where you gonna do with it after the game, I have no idea. But they always bring that out. Uh, oh, where's the obligatory turkey leg? Oh, there it is, you know, you get some guy hold the turkey leg. Well, the Lions had the unique tradition of being on Thanksgiving for the last 75 years, okay? So when I first got season tickets in the 90s, I thought, I bet if I dress like a pilgrim, I'll be on TV. Well, sure enough, I was, you know, John Madden circled me with my turkey leg. 26 years later, we're still doing it, and it's a, it's a great tradition the Lions have. I mean, this is our day. Us as Lions fans, we love our team. We love our tailgating, Thanksgiving. And don't get no better than this. Look at this tailgate. Having fun, great food. My man cooking perks back there in walleye. We're just tearing it up. And guess, Lions, let's go, baby. And, and guess We're what? Win today, baby. And, and guess what else? We get to watch a football yeah. game too. That's a special thing. Woo! When I was a kid, Thanksgiving was always at my Grandma Sally's house. She'd start a big pot of rice and beans in the morning and by kickoff of the Lions game, the family had all trickled in. I remember my uncle squeezing onto the couch and me and my cousins on the floor of the den watching the game. When Grandma died in 2006 and things changed. Instead of her house, now we rent out a hall. But there are still three constants, rice and beans, family, Lions football. And even though Grandma's gone, I know she's smiling. The very last game ever at Tiger Stadium was on Thanksgiving 1974. And my dad, so I asked him early on, 
can we go to the Thanksgiving Day game this year? It's going to be the last game ever at Tiger Stadium. And I don't know. It's probably September, maybe early October. And he tells me, yeah, we'll go. I didn't think I ever needed to come back and reconfirm that we were going. He told me, yes, so we're going. We never discuss it again until Thanksgiving morning. I wake up, get dressed, come downstairs, and he still sleeps. And I'm trying to figure out why, why isn't he ready to go? Knock on the bedroom door, like, Dad, it's, it's time to go. The game starts in a little while and he's, he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. And I re referenced the conversation we had back in September, early October, you said we we're going to the game. Gets up, changes clothes, and before kickoff, we're at the game. But you know, later on in life, I realized as his son, he just said, yes, son, we're going, and completely forgot completely forgot but just the man that he was got up somehow found his tickets I don't remember how but by kickoff we were sitting in the bleachers at Tiger Stadium for the very last game ever at that stadium and that was one of those things Good memories. yeah Does it matter if we win or lose no Oh, Got up and we went. And it's always a joke among my friends. I mean, do you want to do this to your kid? You know, do you want to do this to your son? Do you want to, you know, bring him into the misery of being a Lions fan? It really, I mean, I had a lot of those conversations. We're all part of this very special club. And we put our faith, we put all of our confidence in this team known as the Detroit Lions. But look what we do, we come together and we represent one team, the Honolulu Blue. It's the pride. We went 0-16 and, and we still here. We still here. That's love. Not just love for, for, the, for our fans, for our team, but just love for everybody that's, that's representing Detroit. Jump on or jump off, because we're going to be rolling. Big lion, mate! Guys go out hunting every year, don't they? Deer hunt. They like to ice fish, fish. If they catch no fish, what do they do? Sell their boat? They quit fish? No, they keep going, they go out there. What am I gonna do? Start wearing Steeler gear next week? That's not who I am. And as I remember back to my grandfather, my stepdad, and that camaraderie that builds families, of course he's gonna be a Lions fan. If I had a son, he'd be sitting right here, and he'd be raised a Lions fan 100%. When? the Lions win a Super Bowl. That party is gonna be so massive. I have to be around for it. I don't care, somebody freeze me for crying out loud if I'm not around. I gotta be around for that bash. When the Lions win, and I believe they will win, uh, when that happens, look out. This region would absolutely go crazy. And if you take a look at the fighting spirit of the city of Detroit, surrounding suburbs, what we've been through, what we've done for this nation, just to have your football team give America a punch in the face. Yeah, yeah, baby. When your son is 41 years old, what will your son be saying about the Detroit Lions? Will they have won the Super Bowl by then? Blaha says yes. <laughs> Yeah, but Blaha was around when they were good. He's, he's, got, he's got that. Blaha it, don't look a day over 50. He looks great. Looks good, isn't it? Well, what, yeah, well, I mean, what would he, you're hoping that he would say, I waited it out and I was patient and it was the greatest day of my life. Mm -hmm. That's probably, that's right, the that thing that it is with the Lions. When the Pistons won the championship in 04 and Albert and I were there, like, all right, they'd already won it once. Like the Red, the Red Wings, that was pretty special. There's that hockey Nista crowd, mm -hmm. it's pretty small, that when, couldn't, when Eisman lifted up the cup, I mean, the tears were flowing. But the Lions, yep. oh my God, the city might burn, and, and we've done a great job. Woodward looks great. Yeah. It may all come up in flames. How about the Chicago Cubs? Last year, example. Please don't. The song, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that. That's okay. But yeah. the, they won the World Series, and the son, instead of going to the game, game seven, he listened with his dad. His dad was dead in the ground. He listened to Game 7 with his father. Right, the radio. He took the radio took to the Took the radio to the grave. Funeral. That could happen with a lot of Lions fans when we finally get 
Dan Miller will call the game if we get to the Super Bowl? Does he? Yeah, yeah sure. So instead of listening, the, the father in the ground will be listening to Dan Miller calling the Super Bowl. Could happen. But we don't want Sorry. you to be the one on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> but, but, but imagine, imagine if your son's old enough to appreciate it. Obviously, he's only two now. He's old enough to appreciate it, but you're still on this side of the ground. Imagine that moment where the two of you watch it together. That's why you're doing this. That's the moment we're looking for. Don't, don't waver. Don't waver, man. Do it. I, I think you, you, ra you have such a passion for it, and you, you're putting a movie together. So I think you go for it, and, and you have that love together. And yeah, it might be 12, he might be 20. Maybe he goes to college somewhere. Maybe he's at Western, or maybe he's at U of M, and he calls you up and says, Dad, all my friends down here are Patriots fans. So who knows whether that'll be in 16 years or something. But you say, no, it might be a bonding experience that um, is going to be so special. Truth be told, one of the hardest things I had to deal with this past year putting this together, like, again, another thing that I'm just kind of realizing was like, you know, us as fathers with, with sons, we do these things like that we think are going to have lasting meaning with our kids. Like me doing this whole freaking thing last year. I was, I don't think I watched any games live with my son, you know, it may have been after. And again, he's two, he don't know the difference. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, you know, I realized that the last year putting this together, I missed a lot of that time with him. And that's one of the things, like, I don't want to be the type of person who misses even the opportunity for these moments. Life is so freaking short. And at the end of the day, like when we interviewed all these fans, yeah, we all have the moments where we remember specific games, but more than anything else, it was like time together with friends, family, tailgating, all that kind of good stuff. I think that's the only reason that people still stay fans, right? It's not because of anything other than the community and the hope. And I think that's probably how I want to raise my son. Sometimes when you start out on a journey, you think you're headed to one destination, but end up someplace completely different. You suffer setbacks and enjoy small victories, each making you a little bit stronger and wiser than the day before. And as I raise my son to be a Lions fan, it won't be about the wins and the losses. Because at the end of the day, that's not what matters. What matters is that someday I'll be gone, and he won't remember the score. But what he will remember is the hope and the journey, but most importantly, the heart of a Lions fan.